Welcome back to the Global Guesting Weekly Podcast, the podcast on all things geopolitics and forecasting. Today, we are joined by David McCullough, the Managing Director and Super Forecaster at Good Judgment, Inc. David works at Good Judgment with their government relations, financial relations, and other relations, and has uh, 20 years of marine archaeology behind his belt. David, welcome to the show. Thanks. Great for Great to be here. So your background comes from anthropology and more specifically archaeology. Uh, As someone with a little bit of archaeology experience, I spent one summer on a Middle Stone Age site, I could somehow see how both the analysis of artifacts and sites in general, as well as the actual process of conducting archaeology, trained you in skills productive to good forecasting. Uh, Do you think that your background um, in archaeology has sort of helped you become a better forecaster and sort of what ways do you think it has? Yeah, I definitely do. And it's, it's funny. Um, I'm an archeologist. There's actually other archeologists who are on our super forecasting team that came from the good judgment project. It's one of the, uh, you know, the fields that actually produces good forecasters. And we have a little bit of evidence on that, but uh, it's for many reasons. Um, As you'd mentioned, I, my first degrees in uh, anthropology, cultural anthropology, and that helps just, you know, seeing different points of view when you're establishing base rates and things like that. You're, you're able to, to step outside and see things from the outside because you've been doing that. I did that for my first degree. Um, the other thing is, you know, archaeology, I can find a piece of pottery, two stones, and maybe a piece of wood. Somebody is going to ask me to, to, you know, what happened here? What exactly? What does this mean? So I have to construct a narrative to explain, okay, this was a wall. I have, you know, comparative cases, like similar to base rates. I've seen walls like this in sites all over. So I can say this was this type of wall. So you can start to construct this narrative and tell a story. In forecasting, you're doing the same thing. You're just taking it and flipping it over. Instead of telling, you know, getting sparse information and talking about the past, I have very sparse information and I'm going to talk about the future. So I'm going to see where did I see things like this happen before? Where, where can I start constructing my narrative for the future? And I can put a a probability, which is also important, on what I'm telling you. Um, as I just said, probabilities is also very important. When I was doing commercial archaeology, um, they were not overly concerned whether I found a really cool shipwreck that we could go see or a really cool site we could go see, but they were very, very concerned about what probability that this was a significant archaeological discovery. Um, you know, what probably would I put on that? Because I want to build, say, a $2 billion wind farm. And if there's a, a very high probability that there is a significant shipwreck in the middle of that wind farm, well, that's a problem. So we need to decide this. So you have to be very comfortable with probabilities. And when you're reporting that, then given the probabilities. The other thing, and that's, that's more of an all-encompassing, you know, just philosophical The uh, philosophy of archaeology applies to forecasting, but also the tools involved helped me when I was super forecasting um, because we get questions of Ebola coming to the United States. How, you know, when's the first case going to show up? Where is it going to show up? And, you know, you can start forecasting on that and we'd be on the platform working with your team. And then I was like, well, the skills that I used in archaeology involved uh, ArcGIS, Mm -hmm. things along those lines. And I used to map out shipwrecks. I used to map transportation routes, um, currents, where things would land. And I said, well, why can't I do that for, for a forecasting question? Why can't I you know, figure out where all the cases of Ebola are now in Africa? What are the transportation routes to the major cities? Where are the airports? How often do those flights go? How vetted are they? Where do they go from there? And you could start thinking of dispersion rates using ArcGIS, the same tools that I would use in archaeology. I was using forecasting. So it applies in a lot of ways. Yeah, you know, you were mentioning, you know, sometimes you come across a piece of pottery, maybe like two stone tools, and you have to sort of construct a narrative about what happens there. And so you have all these like conditional probabilities based on comparison cases. Maybe it's only like 28% likely that it's that, but everything else is very much lower. But to me, that also tells that you're in an environment where you should sort of update your assumptions about sites. And you see that a lot in anthropology and archaeology you know like when did humans first leave africa is a date that is always changing when did anatomically modern humans um sort of first emerge is always changing and so it seems like because of that environment you're also just 
sort of like naturally like Bayesian updaters because you have to be because you have very partial information um, yeah. in the field. Um, yeah, there's also, yeah. I can name a specific uh, circumstance where I was actually working on a site in Ireland and it was a lake dwelling. And, you know, the, the consensus of lake dwellings are they're usually Iron Age. And so we basically went into it with the mindset, oh, this is Iron Age. You know, we have a lot of base, you know, studies, base rate on these being Iron Age. We weren't finding anything indicative of Iron Age at all. And so I started to think, okay, this, this is getting weird. We kept going, no Iron Age stuff, lots of artifacts, really uh, amazing preservation. You can see like ax marks and pieces of wood. And so we said, okay, consensus says this, but in order to do this properly, we're gonna to need to get into other people. Let's make this multidisciplinary, kind of like a team you would use in forecasting. Mm -hmm. And you start bringing in other people. And luckily we were able to get 28 uh, dates um, mass spec uh, spectrometer dates on that. And it fell in line with the Bronze Age. And pretty much every artifact on there fell in line with the Bronze Age. So it actually turned out to be an anomaly that it was an early, early Cranog, whereas everybody was saying Iron Age, this was Bronze Age, but we were able to pull together enough different opinions to kind of fight what we were told it was. Yeah, we to reject the outside view and accept yeah. the inside one instead. And we had we had a preconceived notion going in. And it was, it actually was pretty tense because the press kept coming up to me and asking me, you know, about this Iron Age site. And I was, I couldn't say it. I couldn't say it was Iron Age. I'd be like, well, it's, you know, we don't know. We don't know. You don't know till you do. So, so I'm curious, um, you know, there seems to be a lot of overlap between forecasting and archaeology. Do archaeologists think about sort of tracking progress and performance the same way that forecasters do? Or is there... Um, sort of a way that archaeologists track their accuracy when it comes to like looking at past sites, and is that something that you know uh, different contractors take into account when they're looking for archaeologists to dig up a site? You know, have they been accurate in the past? I could see where that would almost be a conflict of interest for some developers. If you you maybe you don't want someone who's going to tell you there is hmm. a nice shipwreck in the middle of your project. Um, and that's, it's only going to be words because you're not going to go really look at it. But it, it, it's something a lot of like people I work, yes, if you're a good archaeologist, you, you know, really track it and say, okay, I knew this was this and, you know, research more into it. But like I said, a lot of people maybe don't track it as closely as they should. And it's not something that uh, they would use to, uh, to choose an archaeologist. I think you'd be going for the lowest bidder. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the work in, a lot of times as an underwater archaeologist, there's sort of a lot of implicit forecasting questions that you're creating. And then I assume at the work, you've done a good judgment that you've sort of been involved in question writing and know a lot about the anatomy of what makes a good forecasting question. And this is something that yeah. Andrew and I had talked about on the Crowd Money cast about the real importance of getting out good questions and how if you look at across all the different platforms, um, there tends to be a trade off of either really good density of questions, um, or like a high volume of questions that just happen to have a sort of large quantity of good questions, but maybe the percentage isn't as quite good. Um, do you have a sense of the qualities that make a good forecasting question and what differentiates the good ones from not just bad forecasting questions, but sort of middling um, subpar questions. I do. And uh, one of the things that I, I can say about that is when, if you're writing forecasting questions, the main thing that uh, we at Good Judgment says, you have to consider, we call it ACE. It has to be actionable. Um, if you're gonna ask me a question and I'm gonna forecast it, I'm gonna spend, I don't know how many hours forecasting on it. Uh, is the answer gonna mean anything to you? If I come back with a forecast of 75%, is that going to cause you to change your mind or make a decision? And is that different than if the consensus forecast is 70% or 60%? You know, is it something that is going to drive a decision? Um, it has to be clear. There can be only one answer. And this is where I've seen some other questions come out where it can resolve in a few things, not on our platform, but on other platforms. And that, that's, the, that's the worst case scenario. Um, if, it's, if it's not clear, if there isn't one answer addressing your intent, start over. You want it to be clear and you want it to have a clear end. You know, the, the resolution happens at a certain time and 
as of the next day after that question closes, there's an answer. Um, sometimes it takes clients a little bit longer than I would like to decide, you know, whether it's been answered, but after that resolution date, there is an answer and it's clear to everybody. And hopefully circumstances haven't changed and it's, uh, you know, and it's still actionable. One of the things that uh, is, you know, weird way to think about it. The whole point of forecasting is to provide, you know, clear direction, clear data for people to make policy decisions. The problem with that is that's the worst thing ever for a forecasting competition. Because if, if you're good forecasters, if you have a highly skilled forecasting team and you're asking a question of, could there be a problem up here? And we're coming in at, you know, we see a very clear 85%, 87%, there's, there's gonna be a problem. Now you see these signposts, like if you're updating all the time and you're checking the forecasts, the decision maker could go, this is a problem. Let's, let's pass policy. Let's make a decision to, you know, to, to circumvent this difficulty. And that's great. You've achieved the end goal of forecasting. You've provided good information for a successful decision to be made. You've killed your Breyer score because now that's not going to happen. You were at 85% for the last five months and now mm. it's zero and you could go to zero, but you've basically gotten the worst score ever because you influenced the decision. So it's something where, you know, if the question's really good, it provides valuable information and can kill your score. Interesting. What, wh how often do you see that being done where you have policymakers making decisions on forecast? You have a, an, an, an example of, of where that's done. I, I know the CDC, for instance, they have their own flu forecasting um, system, which they've just announced, I think, another billion dollars going into it to expand that to uh, a, emerging diseases? Is that sort of where you usually see policymakers acting on forecasts? Um, or do you see it sort of wider in the intelligence community? Um, I could see that playing out anywhere. Um, intelligence community, CDC. A good example of that is when, you know, COVID first was uh, starting to be talked about. We were forecasting on that very, very early. And we had no idea, are we going to be good at this? This is, you know, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm a doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. Um, and most of us aren't. So how are we going to forecast this thing where we have virologists and all sorts of people who know way more than I do about, you know, COVID and what's going on. So we decided to run some questions on it, see how we do. And I, I don't know if you followed that. We did very, very, very well. Um, and there was reasons for that. And we did way better than the CDC. It's because of human agency. Um, the CDC is great at producing models, um, forecasting models, ways to control the virus. They weren't great, at least at that time, of predicting what are humans going to do? Mm. Is somebody going to be upset about politics and decide they're not going to get a vaccination? Is somebody going to have this huge party or a huge festival and have all these people come? You know, things that they're thinking, well, if everybody does what they're supposed to do, this is what we're looking at. Whereas when we were forecasting, we were thinking, but what are people going to do? And because of that, we did very well. They did poorly, but they learned from us things they needed to consider in their modeling as time went on. So now it's much more difficult for us to, to outperform them because they're now, they're now taking these things into consideration. So by making discoveries during the forecasting process, again, you can kind of shoot yourself in the foot if you were looking to say, oh yeah, we're best. But uh, you know, at, in, at the end of the day, unless it's strictly a competition with questions that nobody's making life or death situation you know, calls on, um, I think it's a win for forecasting to, you know, your score, people will probably hate me for saying this, but your score doesn't really matter. Was it a successful endeavor that saved lives or save money or something along those lines, um, more so than your score. Mm -hmm. And you know, as 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 Satapa sort of showed in in those tournaments, you also have the best forecasters who try to be overconfident, right? If they're if they're ninety, they might they might actually go up to ninety five or ninety eight towards the end because they're trying to maximize their score. Which for a policymaker, they might be like, wait, what's going on? Whereas what's really happening is that it's a player in the tournament trying to um, get some yeah. points at the at at the end. Uh, it seemed like in that question, and I think we've heard this from Regina Joseph and some others, that forecasters really sort of do better than 
experts in models like early on, like in novel situations, because, you know, the human model can be very ad hoc and you can really change and tweak it on the fly rather than having to sort of formal, formally sort of code things. Um, do you see that sort of across novel events? And do you think like the CDC, for instance, wouldn't have considered changes to human behavior if there weren't human forecasters who first sort of came through and use that in their models and achieve success and therefore that informed later on the more um, formal models? I think they're clever enough that they, they probably thought about it. Where the difficulty comes in is what human behavior? What are people going to do? What people aren't going to do? And that's where when you're running something with uh, good forecasters, one of the main things, like prob probability is nice. The numbers are nice. There's a 79% chance. And, but the more important part of that is really good forecasters who have you know, actively open-minded thinking are going to be saying, but if this were to happen, I would change my forecast. On the other hand, this could happen and I could change my forecast. And we have clients who would rather see that than the 79% because nowadays pretty much everybody has internal forecasters. They have people, they have planners, there's people doing things. And what they want to know is, did this group of completely and totally unrelated people out in the world consider a bunch of things that we never even thought of? Did they come up with something to say, you know, what if uh, some woman freaks out at a 7-Eleven about masks and that behavior becomes contagious? Did we think of that? We thought, you know, the human element was there, but we didn't know what to think about. Where, you know, during our uh, commenting process, we're constantly saying, oh, this could happen or this could happen this kind of thing. On the other hand, if this person was to do this, I would change my forecast. And it's that information which really informs the models. So it's not that they didn't think of it, they didn't think exactly what they needed to consider. Mm. And there's always extra things you can add in, you know, as you go on. But the more data you can get to input into these models, the better, but you need to have somewhere to get the data from. So it seems like, you know, obviously with forecasting approaches and adoption is sort of still in its nascency as demonstrated or illustrated by, you know, your comments on the CDC. Um, and you, I would imagine, have a front row seat to that sort of journey from um, sort of triviality to, you know, getting more widespread adoption um, because you facilitate workshops for forecasting. What has that experience been like for you? And how have you seen people, um, especially on the government side, sort of uh, respond to these new ideas and approaches to thinking about policy in the future? It's it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, the, the main thing that we, we try to stress before the workshops are things, none of us want your job. We're not here to replace you. That's not, you know, what we're trying to do is give you another tool to add to your, your either your analyst toolbox or your planner toolbox. Something that just gives you something in addition to what you already have. And we get different levels of acceptance. The finance is very accepting of us um, because they're looking, you know, they're gonna do what they do anyway. But any advantage they can get, be it a you know one percent in accuracy, could be major returns. So they're they're very interested in you know how the process works and getting you know their interns and younger people to come in with with a, a broader mindset on how to think about things. Um, some of the older, more established uh, entities in the government, probably elsewhere, are maybe not as open where, you know, great, you're telling me this, what do I do with it? And, and a lot of that has to do with the way people think. Um, we do have people who, you know, if I was to tell you there's a 85% or we're better yet, a 70% chance of something happening. And then you were to say, so it's definitely gonna happen. Well, no, in seven out of 10 worlds, it's gonna happen, but in three out of 10, it's not. So it's not gonna happen. Well, no, I just said, so it's, it's getting them to take the data that forecasters you know, produce from, from any forecasting uh, platform system, what do they do with it? And certain people are better at figuring out how to use that information. And so that, that seems to be the, the biggest hurdle. Um, as far as the training goes, they all seem to enjoy the training and everybody personally learns stuff from it. But again, it comes down to, so we have this training. Um, now we, you know, we want to forecast on our questions and we can help them with that. And so, that usually works well. When they try to do it themselves, there can be some pitfalls and then they don't know what to do with it. And all it takes is, you know, a few failures on, we don't know what to do with this information and people get disheartened. 
So it's something um, hopefully will be integrated more in the future because it, it's very, very valuable. It's just getting acceptance of it. And there's always the people, and you guys, have you read the book, Super Forecasting? Yeah. A lot of people will be like, well, that's common sense. Well, no kidding. You know, of course that bias is there or not. The main thing on that though is are you, you know, every time someone asks you to make, you know, to make a forecast or better answer a question, are you considering that bias? Are you saying, you know, when someone asks you a question, are you, if you're looking at a clock or if you're looking at numbers, you're anchored on a probability. If you think probabilistically, that might influence you. You know, I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, I think it's Focus with Will Smith, where, you know, they plant a number all over the place because subconsciously you'll absorb that number and they're able to use that in a bet. But it does work. We've done experiments in workshops um, where we've put numbers on things that had absolutely nothing to do with anything. And on one question out of 35 respondents to that question, five of them actually put the exact number and it had nothing to do with anything. That then, that then like speaks that in some ways humans are really receptive to numbers, and yet it seems oh, yeah. like part of the re resistance or or barrier to getting forecasting adopted is also like the understanding and comprehension of numbers. Like it's there's both like a draw, but then also some sort of push out. Uh, on Twitter, there's been a graphic that and shared within the forecasting community showing when people say like likely or very yeah. likely, their range of actually what they're saying in terms of probability is sort of all skewed. And um, our colleague, Mikhail Dubrowski, he always brings up um, when Obama was making the decision to go in with bin Laden, his advisors really told him 70-30. Um, if you sort of aggregated their forecast, but he said it was a 50-50 situation, which is different than a 70-30. A and you would think from a planning perspective or sort of risk mitigation that you would want to have an intuitive difference between the two. So, you know, it's been years since IARPA did the first ACE tournament, yeah. since Super Forecasting came out. Um, I'm going to assume that in terms of where people like you and where Philip Tetlock would like to see forecasting adopted has not sort of been achieved within the government um, mm -hmm. at large. Would, would, would that be fair? It's, it's, it's fair to say that a lot of it has to do with responsibility. Um, if I tell you, if I say something's risky, um, that experiment, I've actually, I've seen that, the graph is, that's I think between 22 and 84, 84% <laughs> likely if I say risky, which is great, remember that. Because if anybody ever asks you anything, say it's risky. And then, you know, when it happens or not, you can say, well, I said it was risky and you're fine. Um, but as soon as you assign an actual probabilistic number down, you know, to a percent, say 74%, you've now put yourself into a position where you say exactly, you know, what you feel, but you're accountable for it. Mm. So um, I tried to, I, I was saying uh, earlier, that I tried to do that in archaeology. And my corporate structure for where I worked wanted nothing to do with that. Because they're like, well, if we say there's, you know, a moderate probability, you know, there you are with risky. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're covered. If I tell them that there's a 76% chance they're going to hit a shipwreck, um, that's very different. And, it, you know, it causes them to maybe spend more money on that area if they're surveying to avoid that area if they think that risk is too high. So I, I think a lot of you know, responsibility is, assigned, it is on the individual or the team that's forecasting a certain probability. And um, I hate to say it, a lot of people don't want that kind of you know, liability on their head. You know, if, if, you were, if, if you told me there's an 86% chance that the, uh, the Jets are gonna win the Super Bowl, I don't know if you would say that. But if you were, that's something, you know, really? Are you so I can hold you to that because you've just basically locked yourself into that. Or you could say they might win. So it's something, you know, if, if it's something where your promotion or your pay rate or even, you know, your job is dependent upon decisions and you want to, you know, maybe not be so exact. So I, I think there's reasons behind that. So staying on the topic of, you know, adoption of forecasting in government, um, you know, it seems to me that for there to be greater adoption, sort of the goal of forecasting as it exists right now might need to change. 
So uh, right now it seems like, you know, on Metaculus or even Good Judgment Open, you know, the goal of forecasting is to get a low Briar score, to become a super forecaster, to get a new rank on Metaculus. But in government, as you've been saying, you know, policymakers need to know how to use these forecasts to make decisions. Um, you know, do you think that there's a way that these platforms can sort of um, take that forecasting one step further and try and inform, you know, how to translate those forecasts into actionable, you know, um, information? Or yeah, like how do you think about that working with these clients? Uh, again, we're, we're, we're at the whole, uh, the loggerheads yeah. of forecasting competition versus information that can be used effectively. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to win your forecasting competition, um, you know, that's great. And this, the questions can't matter. If someone's looking to make a decision, if someone, you know, calls me on the phone and they're like, we want to run a certain number of questions, they're, they're very specific, we need answers on this. And we run it with the super forecasters and they're coming back with probabilities that mean something. The decision-making process of our client can change and they can use that information to make a change in decision. You've just killed all the super forecaster scores. But as far as a valuable tool within that organization, that's huge. So it's, if you're looking at some, someone like Metaculus or even uh, GJ Open, we still we run questions and people do change decisions. Um, it is something where that's not the best tool for it. They just need to understand that if you're going to run, you know, call it, I'll call it a tournament for forecasting for your answers, it needs to be differently incentivized as opposed to just Briar scores. Or Could just, it should be an award for, you know, if you made a forecast that caused us to make a decision that saved 300 lives, um, that's a win. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there should be some sort of, I don't know, team award or something just to say, you know, these, these guys are good. And we do that. Um, on Good Judgment Open, it's not just Briar score. It's also in the commentary. Um, people can upvote comments, like comments. And that's, to me, that's more important because all the, the really good stuff, and a lot of our clients think the same, is in the comments. I hadn't thought about that. I hadn't thought that this circumstance would happen. I hadn't thought about this. And that's what's being brought to light. So if people are upvoting constantly on those kind of comments, we do give you know badges, things like that, saying, oh, this, this is very important too. And that's it's also one of the things I believe they used when they were looking at super forecaster status. You know, if this person is constantly making comments that are super valuable, yeah, they might not have the best Briar score in the world, but wow, they're really contributing to their team, they're doing really well. That's a that's a better way to look at it. Yeah, I think there was research from Carolyn Minow, Chris Karvetsky, and some others that looked at um, forecaster rationale and that that was like a very big predictive factor in terms of accuracy. If they mentioned base rates, if they sort of hedged on one hand this, on the second hand, on the third hand, um, that um, do you sort of like curate comments for yeah. for for clients based like on that criteria or other criteria to sort of present them with? We, I mean, there's depending on what the client's looking for, but we actually produce different you know styles of reports for, and we do commentary reports. Um, you know, they're anonymized and provided to the client to go through. And I know Chris has been doing stuff with the, uh, you know, the machine learning and stuff. He's got some really good graphics on, I don't know if you've seen them, on the words most popular. Um, on the other hand, and things like that, where people are really, you know, deep thinking, they can identify that. So you know, I've talked with Chris about that before, but we do that for clients. You know, if they're looking at a certain issue, again, some people like the black box idea. You put in a question and you get a number. Um, most clients don't most clients are more interested in. So why are they saying that? And more, per, more particularly on say August 17th, this forecast changed from 34 to 45%. And then what happened? What happened around that date to influence the forecasting stream so much? And we'll take that in consideration when writing the reports, any significant events that influence the forecasting stream, negative or positive, we'll provide that within the, the report for the client to say, okay, so things are changing here and we get more ideas here. So yeah, we do. And it's all, we store all of it. All of it's curated. You don't want it all because for some questions, I don't know how much time you have, but uh, you know, if I was to give you a thousand pages of comments, which there are for most questions, 
you would want to read it. it it's similar to, you know, when I worked in archaeology, I'd, I, I did reports that were 6,000 pages long of geophysical analysis. Um, to be honest with you, you know, the head of, you know, the client, they didn't care. They were like, great, executive summary. Do we have a problem? What is it? How do we, you know, things like that. What's the problem? And that's all they want to know. And that's, you know, our clients are the same way. They don't have the time. But if we can give them the highlights of what's changing the, the stream and influencing it and the main signposts in a certain direction, that's what makes them happen. So speaking about not wanting to read it all and having too much information, um, where do you see forecasting as a tool to sort of process news information? Um, you know, we're talking about how it affects policymakers, but it would also seem, you know, that what are the pieces of news that move a forecast could be a sort of another way to interpret the news. So instead of just following and going to the New York Times and seeing what's affecting the economy, maybe you go to Good Judgment Open and you're following uh, what will the U.S. Um, CPI be and what will U.S. GDP growth and looking at comments in the news that sort of come along with changes in, in the community forecast. Um, do, you, do you see sort of forecasting growing one day as being a way to sort of filter that information? And then also, do you think when you're looking at sort of news coverage and when they sort of talk about events, they are very much in the vague verbiage cate uh, category. Um, and there's never been lower sort of trust in news media in the U.S., but also globally. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that, you know, implementing quantified forecasting and, and tracking within news media itself, not just as a way to follow news, but in sort of traditional mainstream news could be a way to sort of regain credibility and sort of um, make news less sensational and more sort of quantified and have some sort of objective parameters behind it. I, I could see it happening, but it's one of these things where, I mean, if you look at the news things, okay, so forecasters, for the most part, we're not real exciting. Um, when we're writing our, you know, a forecast, it's not very exciting. The best forecast, the best commentary, say I, I've changed my forecast now for me, I've changed my forecast by three points. I'll cite maybe four or five news sources and personally, I, if I don't see the same thread in at least three usually conflicting news sources, I don't know how much I buy it. Because I know in, in news, I mean, the news industry is in the entertainment industry, industry. And there's a lot of ego to play. So if I was to say something controversial and stuff, people love that. I, I don't do that. Um, I say really boring stuff about the three, you know, my three sources that I've come and I'm thinking maybe this could happen here, but I'm also thinking on the other hand, this source says this. So as far as for, there would have to be some sort of, you know, system in place to, again, they'd be interpreting something. And again, you're back to someone's opinion and every forecast is somebody's opinion. I mean, the main thing with forecasting is we're never, ever, ever looking for consensus. We're not trying to convince anybody of anything. My forecast isn't gonna change because somebody else provided contradictory information that I don't agree with. I'm not going to try to be at the same forecast as my team. I'm gonna forecast what I feel. Where the brilliance comes in is everybody on my team is forecasting what they feel. Now, you know, we'll go back to competition. For the competition mode, we all wanna be the MVP. So we're all gonna look at everybody's news sources. Now, right there, what I've just said is also already more labor intensive than reading the New York Times. Because instead of reading the New York Times, I'm going to read that and maybe 10 other sources that other people provide, that I provide. And so we're all trying to be the best. As far as getting a, a singular news outlet, as it were, or information outlet, um, the forecast itself will give you what people think is happening. The individual forecast provide and the commentary provided by the forecasters would take a lot of time and effort. And again, I'm not trying to convince anybody on my team either. They might, they're not trying to convince me. I'm not trying to convince them. I'm just giving them a blank slate with some information on it and what I think. And they're going to take that and do what they think. The news also isn't trying, ideally, to convince you of something either, right? They're also just supposed to tell you the, the facts of what's going on, right? You know, I've, I've in theory. People, <laughs> and they've, they've told me, that my, my favorite ones are, you know, after the election in 2016, it was, an it was inevitable that Trump was going to win. Despite the models that they publish showing 99%. Well, 
Yeah, despite the, the previous nine months of people saying the exact opposite, including the guy who just said it was inevitable. Um, so, you know, there, it's again, it comes down to a lot, and I'm sure a lot of news people get upset with me, but a lot of ego in the news. Um, the more sensationalistic you can be. Uh, I remember back when I was doing archaeology, I was on site somewhere, and uh, I really don't watch network TV too much, but I figured, ah, sure, I'm in a hotel, why not? And it seemed that every subsequent reporter telling the same story of a news event that had happened that day had to try to outdo the previous report. And by the time it came to midnight, I'm surprised these people weren't jumping up and down screaming because they're trying to, you know, say it more emphatically than the previous guy. And that that's like the exact opposite of how it works in the calm world of forecasting, where here's a bit of information. You know, I think it means this, you might think differently, but it's, it's good for you to have that. It's good for you to know this. This is all stuff you should know when thinking about this, as opposed to individuals slowly saying, oh my God, did you see this? And the next guy, it's, in, it's insane. So it, it's kind of, it, it was kind of eye-opening for me to watch that. And it terrified me. And it seems like a similar problem with government, right? Well, there it's accountability and in journalism, it's ego. It, it, it both comes down to a sense of accountability too, right? At, at the end of the day, um, preventing it in both journalism and in government. A, a sort of similar core issue, it seems yeah. like. It, it, it's it, accountability accounts for a lot. And that, again, that's one of the brilliant things about, you know, forecasting is you don't know who I am when I'm forecasting. You don't know what I do. Yeah. Um, you don't even have my name. So it's, it's the, something where I can say things that, you know, I could be right or wrong. Um, it doesn't matter. And you're not going to judge me on it. I don't mind being judged. It's not personal. Um, there's surprisingly little conflict in forecasting, um, as, as I see it. Uh, I used to monitor on Good Judgment Open, and they're up over, I think, 100,000 forecasters. There's the, on the regular internet, I would have probably had to, you know, call police in circumstances and all sorts of crazy stuff. We, you know, we, there's occasional, you know, disagreements, but one of the most brilliant things about it is to disagree without being disagreeable. Mm -hmm. If you go to the super forecaster platform, it's, it's brilliant. There's never any fight. It's, you know, I don't agree with you and I'll provide five sources why I think differently. And you go, okay, and do what you're going to do. And that's, it's, it's, it's brilliant. Yes. What, what is less brilliant is two institutions based on accountability. Don't like yeah. the accountability aspect of forecasting. Well, if, if say, well, the perfect example, you know, if we're sitting in a room, if I was, you know, with a, a CEO of a corporation or a general, if you're in the military and he says, I think X is a great idea. And we're, you know, we should do this and all that. What am I going to say? I like my job. I'd love a promotion. Um, I'd, I'd like a raise. I'd like all these things. So I'm going to say, you know what? I think X is a great idea. And I, here's three reasons why. I'm not going to turn around and say, well, no, I, I kind of think why is a better idea. And here's three reasons why I don't agree with you. Um, that's not going to happen. Mm. Everybody's going to be accountable for the decision. But again, it comes down to accountability from if I agree with him and it goes wrong, I'm covered. Um, if I say something different and it goes wrong and I disagree with him, I am so not covered. And I'm looking at the, you know, the pages of for work now. So it, it's something where the accountability calls for a lot, but anonymous forecasting kind of takes out some of that. Again, not exciting to read, but it, it makes people really say what they think and get to what, you know, hopefully will be the best advice, the best information. So let's say two super forecasters are disagreeing about a forecast mm -hmm. um, and they're having a conversation about it. Will they sort of um, address specific parts of the other person's forecast when they're disagreeing? So say like, you know, I disagree with that base rate. I think it should be this, or I think you weighted this piece of information too highly and I weighted it lower. How do they sort of have that discourse and how do they talk about their own forecast with one another? I've, I've, I've been in that and a lot of times there's, you know, some cheerful banter, but it would be something along the lines like, oh yeah, I saw this, this piece of information, which I think this could be important on. Someone might come back and say, oh yeah, I, I was reading through that. And, and I don't often see it escalate to the point of a confrontation like that, because I know, you know, I, my big thing is, oh, thanks for that information. I'll consider it would be, my, would be my response. I wouldn't, it, it's not worth my time to, 
you know, they've provided me with the best information they have. I've provided them with my best information. You know, if we can look for more information, provide more, that's great. But it's not worth my time to argue with you about your information and what you think. I've seen what you think by your forecast. I know you think this, so it's not, and you've considered it. And, you know, academically and intellectually, I respect your opinion. And I'm sure you have reasons for doing that. So I'm not going to try to, I don't want to change your mind. Um, You're not going to change mine, but thanks for the information. Because I didn't know, you know, of the three sources that you've cited, maybe I only heard of two. And the third one, like, oh, I, I hadn't considered that one. You know, now that I've read it and considered it, it doesn't really change my forecast. But wow, awesome. More information for me. So, When it comes to, like, changing, changing minds and sort of building better forecasts in collaboration, um, I think it was Pavel Atanasov. He mentioned that one really great technique that, uh, or this could have been Balkan Devlin that said one great technique that forecasters can do is to conduct a pre-mortem. So before the forecast resolves, think about what went wrong. And, you know, a really recent example where I think this could have been useful would have been, say, had the intelligence community conducted a pre-mortem in terms of the evacuation, um, I mean, from the withdrawal from Afghanistan and sort of starting with their initial forecast of, of sort of six months to two years in terms of how long the government had, that might have been their forecast, but maybe they had a pre-mortem that said if all these provincial capitals that would be the basis for defense, you know, fell in weeks mm-hmm. instead of months, maybe that's an indicator that things are going to go faster, therefore you know, a, a, a week or two before Kabul fell that they might have sort of shift tactics because they had a sort of pre-mortem in place. Um, do you often conduct pre-mortems and is that a useful thing for super forecasters? And do you think that technique in general should be applied more broadly? Because, you know, we always hear about intelligence failures and it seems like one way to have sort of solved that would have been if they had anticipated those failures and sort of game them out in advance. Yeah, I, I'm a huge proponent of pre-mortems. Um, we did one during the 2016 election where, you know, you kind of say, you know, what happens if this person wins? What happens if this person wins? The two, you know, opposing characters. Huge amounts of information. With Afghanistan, they would have to, there would have to be something to pre-mortem a situation. So they could have said, okay, we'll pull it, you know, it's it was very hasty. Um, we're gonna pull out in two, in a week, two weeks. Um the, yeah, they should have basically said, so what happens if we pull out in two weeks? And I, I don't know, you know, it would have had to be basically everybody in the ODNI kicking in, which is hard to do in the first place, but to get enough different points of view as to things that could go wrong. Um, the other hand would be, you know, we pull out in two weeks. What, you know, what's good? What's the best thing that happens in two weeks? What's the worst thing that can happen if we pull out in two weeks? And take those those two conversations, and look and see what we're looking at. That, you know, I keep every time I say two weeks. That that to me is an insanely short time frame to to get actionable. I can see if it's a reaction, can be a shorter time frame, but for that move, I don't. I wasn't involved in the politics of that. I don't know what you know what was going on internally in the government, but there had to be there had to be a driver there somewhere that I'm not aware of. But I think a pre-mortem exercise on that, just to see, you know, would they have identified where we're at now? Would they have identified, well, very soon thereafter, Taliban's going to take over, and there it is. Um, And now we're trying to get along with them. Would we have seen that coming? Or did we, you know, did we anticipate that the government that was in place, the Afghani government, was going to just, you know, jump in a helicopter and go? You know, did we anticipate that? Um, It seems, you know, hindsight, hindsight bias. Yeah, well, now it's pretty obvious that was going to happen. But there's Um, probably also a base rate of, you know, leaders in that situation fleeing as well. That could have been, you know, made it's, you know, probably higher than a 5% likelihood, right? I I think they said what happened was highly unlikely, which for us, I think is 95, between 95 and 99, or or, sorry, 5 and 1% likelihood. Um, It seems like the base rate would be higher than that, um, just by default. Have you seen, I mean, you, you talk about the, the study. I mean, there's one that just asked people what, you know, the words meant, the words of estimated probability. That's still codified in uh, the intelligence community directive, 203, I think it is, where there's eight levels. It was established by Sherman Kent, which are the words of estimated probability, which actually, you know, there's no overlapping words of estimated probability. So if you say something, it means specifically bracketed. You can, And it, it's something where I'm not super comfortable with that. But it's 
it's a step in the right direction. So I'm sure words were used, um, they kind of have to be, that you know, identified some of these risks, maybe not all of them, probably not all of them, I'm using probably, um, but it, it's something where it, in my mind, it should have gone a little differently. Um, but again, I don't have all the information, so I, I don't know. It, it, but it is, a, it's an extremely valuable tool. Um, maybe not all the time. When you have a little bit of time to think about it, it helps. Um, if someone was to ask you to, you know, in a couple of days to throw them together, you could do it and it would be better than not doing it. But I, I don't know. Is it more useful if you're like against the consensus? Like we did one for the JCPOA, which I thought was very useful for us to right. really sort of understand our position. Cause from the start of this year, we were very sort of bearish on the likelihood of the U S returning, whereas good judgment and tacticalists were very bullish at the start. Um, and sort of, I think doing the pre-mortem there was useful cause you know, now we're taking their position, all of the biases. Now we're sort of inhabiting it for that position. So we'll argue it very well. Um, and then be more think- confident in our different one. For, the, for those kinds of circumstances, maybe not so much a pre-mortem as putting together a red team proper, um, getting people who aren't forecasting. Say, okay, you're not allowed to forecast, but what I do want you to do is to get into whatever team is doing this and provide information why their forecast is wrong. For, give them the sources that you're seeing, why if they're seeing there's an 83% chance of having, you're seeing a 40% chance. You're not saying that, but you're saying, have you considered this situation here and have that information available? You don't want to super counter them. And you don't, a good red team, the, the problem is it's, it's good forecasters. And in your mind, you're going to want to be forecasting. You're going to be thinking, I, I kind of, I agree with their position. I agree that it's probably 86%. Um, so I can't, why would I forecast 40%? You know, any forecast that I'm going to make to, to the opposite as a red team is going to be wrong. It's not going to be my real forecast. So how that's a number I've just made up. So instead of doing that, you know, being devil's advocate, being the person who's providing the contradictory information, whether you agree with it or not, you know, information is neutral. It's a piece of data, provide them with the data and see how they go from there. See how that forecast looks. And if they, you know, if they're provided a ton of information, but yet it's still not strong enough to, to deter that or to change where that decision's going, that's great. Um, but if it drops their forecast, or if they're at like 86% chance we should do this, but then the, you know, your information and discussion brings it down you know, 50, maybe th- there's more thinking before action, so. It sounds a lot like um, when a lawyer is trying to construct a case for trial, you know, and he'll sit down with somebody and he'll say a point and they'll give what the you know, defense is gonna say and they and try and counter that, just that sort of back and forth to try and get to you know, the strongest uh, possible case for whatever, whatever it is you're trying to do. Yeah, whenever you see that happen in a movie, somebody always comes out with some random piece of information which changes everything. <laughs> exactly, some obscure uh, yeah. volume chapter. The real signal, finally yeah. revealed itself. Luckily we don't see that too often. Not to say that it doesn't happen, but not too often. Um, Clay, unless there's anything else, I think we might be ready to hop into uh, a very exciting section of this podcast that we do every podcast, uh, the rapid fire section. Yes, but before we get to that, Dave, where can all of our listeners find you, connect with you, stay in touch, as well as um, anything, uh, any workshops coming up for forecasters or anything uh, exciting at Good Judgment or Good Judgment Open that uh, our listeners can be excited about? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. Just basically, I, I assume if you look up Good Judgment, I'll come up, but you can look up myself. A, we'll put a link down yeah. below. Okay, great. Yep. And we actually have a roadshow next week, I believe that people can sign up and uh, you can go see it on our website if you go to goodjudgment.com. What's a roadshow? This for the listeners? A roadshow is, it's a two day program where we basically, we cover, um, you know, very, very briefly because everybody, everybody who's there pretty much knows where we came from, but we cover all the things that make for a better forecaster. The things we identified in the Good Judgment Project, um, the research team, it's, it's funny, I was actually teaching this morning on that where during the, the project, I had no, you know, I didn't know these things. I didn't know I was doing this. 
I didn't know I had these things, but as a lab rat, I was subjected to hours and hours of tests, which you know basically showed certain characteristics of a good forecaster, which showed the different biases, how we were combating the biases, how to establish base rates, how to recognize certain things, how to uh, calibrate your confidence for better forecasts. All these things were you know, pulled out of the stuff that we were doing. And in these roadshows, we present this stuff and how to combat certain biases and how to uh, write better questions, which is very important because without a good question, you cannot get a good forecast, even out of the best forecaster and uh, just how to use it in your own personal life. So, and I think it's, uh, I should know the exact date and I ruined a second. Um, this podcast might go up after that date, but. All right. So, but you can tell people basically if they look at the good judgment website, we offer these usually once a month. Mm, great. Um, I think we, we took August off because everybody was on holiday. But uh, yeah, once a month we offer the, the road shows and it, it's a good way to get a, if you're already forecasting, it can help you a lot. And if you're just interested in forecasting, forecasting science, it's a brilliant introduction. So we cover most of the things in the book and even better, there's usually at least two, if not more super forecasters there to uh, answer any questions that anybody has. You know, we're here to help. Again, I don't want anybody's job. I'm here to help. Well, to, you have one final task on this podcast, Dave. You are going to hear a, a growing list of questions. It is now seven rapid-fire forecasting questions that you will have to answer. I think the what? list started off as four. It's grown. but um, So it just gets increasingly challenging uh, for our guests. But that is great for you. Um, the first question is, what is the likelihood that Russia annexes more territory in Eastern Europe by 2026? 26. Oh, I'm going to go with 62. Wow, that's probably the most rapid. All right. Can we get a one one sentence rationale? The assignment. Yeah. The one sentence what? Uh, rationale. A, 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 a um, sort of like a one sentence rapid rationale. A rapid rationale. There you go. RR. Beautiful. One sentence hard. Um, I feel that Russia is becoming more aggressive in that arena, and they are showing evidence of that more and more every day. Beautiful. One sentence. Um, Andrew? Sure. Um, the second question is, what is the likelihood that we find um, either current or you know, past signs, techno signatures, et cetera, of alien life uh, by 2030? This can be single cell organisms all the way to, you know, ET. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say 37%, but I'm not saying it because I don't think it exists. I'm saying it because I don't think we'll find it by then. Good stipulation. What is, this is a two-part question. So what is the likelihood that the U.S. boycotts um, the Beijing 2022 Olympics? And then what is the likelihood that a majority of the five eyes and the quad, so four out of those seven, boycott the Beijing Olympics? The first one, I'm going to say 13%. Um, there is grow. Do you want a rapid rationale for that? Sure. Right. Um, I don't know if you've been seeing some of the memos that have come out of State Department, where basically the way that the uh, Uyghurs are being treated has been called uh, kind of crimes against humanity, uh, genocide, things like that. That's not great talk at this time. Um, for the other groups, I would probably go up to 27%. Mm. And that's mainly because um, the ways, we have a lot of mechanisms here that could control it and other countries might be more an emotional or more sympathetic to the cause of the Uyghurs and there it is. Interesting. I, I would have thought that without, I guess the U.S. is also included in that, but I would have thought, interesting. I'm going to have to rethink our forecast on that. Um, Andrew? Yeah, the third rapid fire question is going to be, what are the odds that the Uyghur clamps are closed by China by 2022? Um, and we always say, you know, that can be, they just put out sort of a PR statement saying that, you know, all of the Uyghurs have now been re-educated and released or, you know, however they want to do it, but that the camps are no longer operational by 2022. January 1st, 2022, all the camps are closed. Or at least stated, right? You know, if, if they ended up, you know, moving them to open pasture instead of a camp, right? Like they could 
but like in terms of PR is the is the essence. Yeah. That... I'm also thinking, you know, scope sensitivity is September 21st. So um, in the next couple of months, I'd say the likelihood is very, very low. Four percent, five percent. That, that, I think that's what Metaculus Media is on that question right now. Um, what is the likelihood that Israel and Saudi Arabia um, normalizes relations, establishes official diplomatic relations by 2025? 2025. So these are longer term. Um, what do you mean by that? What would that entail? Um, embassies and ambassadors. Yeah, it is sort of in line with the Abraham Accord relationships that have already been established with Bahrain and Morocco and Sudan. Yeah, 2025. I'm gonna I'm gonna take the easy answer, fifty percent. Good guess. Um, penultimate question: uh, What are the odds that there's a flare up in the South China Sea before 2023 that results in more than ten deaths from any single country? Um, and we put in the ten deaths part just to sort of quantify or um, set set a benchmark for conflict that it's not right. sort of a uh, random accident. So what would you mean by flare up? Would if, if there was say a Chinese vessel that inadvertently crashes into a fishing vessel and kills 10 people? Does that count? So I think flare up um, sort of connotes intent. Um, so that there's Does some that sort be- of conflict that escalates to a point where there ends up being you know, this, this benchmark of death. So it has, does it have to be mill on mill or can it be mill civilian? or mill civilian, civilian with with intent okay and by south china sea i assume you also mean in the airspace above it um that has not been a sort of caveat that's been brought up yet uh i'll say yes i write questions <laughs> no no it's a, it's, no, it's it's a great point i can tell um i will say yes airspace included okay uh, by when 2023 before 2023, January 1. All next year, too. Yeah. Uh, I would say 31%. And I think I still, my brain's telling me that's a bit high. Um, just because you, the 10 people is, is significant because that that is that is significant. And once you escalate to 10, then it, it can ratchet. So, yeah, I still, I'll, no, no, I'll go to 20. 27%. All right. And then the final question. Um, what is the likelihood that the P5 recognizes the Taliban as the official government of Afghanistan by 2022 and then by 2023? Ooh. I haven't been keeping up with that situation as close as I should. Um, by 2022, again, a few months I'm going to say changes that would be required for people to do that probably won't happen by then. So I'd be 7% 2023, I assume January 1st, 2023. A lot can happen in a year. Um, Yeah, I would go up the great amount to 11%. Hmm. Because I I just... If if, if it were, uh, I'm just curious. I'm guessing if it was a... would a majority be enough to significantly move that? Or are you just thinking like Russia, China, and probably the yeah. other three won't? That's more what I'm thinking. A majority, just you still have you still have some There seems to have been, you know, some significant yeah. negotiation between the US and the Taliban when it came towards yeah. the evacuation. I mean, so maybe there's some quid pro quo going there. One one of the problems that I've seen is a lot of what the Taliban they're they're great at presenting a great story and then doing whatever the hell they want. And like the US, I think sometimes. there's going to have to be a little bit of, okay, great. We have this, you know, this is interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll consider it and then watch them, see what they do. Cause actions are going to speak a lot louder than words. And they haven't really been put in a situation to make a big, to, to make the big mistake or to do something. There's been a lot of talk. Oh, we're going to grant this. We're going to do this. And that's great. And a lot of times they haven't done that. I've, I've read something where, yeah, boys are back at school now. That's awesome. Um, unfortunately, the girls aren't. Um, but it's something where there's a lot of talk and we'll want to, you know, they say, if you're going to, what do they say? 
talk the talk, you got to walk the walk. So we, I think we're going to want to see something more. And, and in my mind so far, I have not seen that. Awesome. Well, we will let you know in, in successive years how these <laughs> forecasts have panned out and give you oh. your Briar score and you can see how you've compared <laughs> to your other fellow super forecasters and other guests on the show. Um, good. And thank you for doing, I, I think this has been the most in spirit rapid fire around so future guest if you're watching the podcast it's round of applause for dave right there um dave it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast um thank you so much for giving you uh, for for giving us and our listeners um all your time uh please everyone a link to dave's linkedin will be down in the description below so if you want to connect with him you'll have that link there um and if there's nothing else then this was the global guessing weekly podcast Thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you next week. Thanks and bye-bye.